I'll say also that it's uh, good tonight to renew fellowship with Mr. Parks. My brother and I goes back many, many, many years. Much water's been under the bridge since those days. You know, the Philippian jailer asked the question. He said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. My dear sinner friend, you can be saved tonight. And therefore, don't go home tonight without Christ and without yielding to him. Upon my heart there is a burden for lost souls that have gone astray. i 
Thank you very much, James, for that ministry tonight. You know, if there was never a sermon preached tonight, there's already been once preached in that last message in song. And I trust the words of that message will ring on in your mind. Uh, don't go home tonight unsaved. And uh, we trust that God will indeed come in saving power into our gathering. It's nice to have, had fel have fellowship again with James. As he said, we do go back a long way. And uh, that can be said for a lot of people. When you get to my stage in life, <laughs> uh, you're always meeting a lot of people that uh, we've had a long relationship with. And it's been a great joy uh, personally to be involved in the mission. It's been a great privilege. Uh, it's always a privilege to preach the gospel, to share the word of God, uh, but I was looking forward to sharing in this mission. I can say that from my heart. And uh, God, has, I've not been disappointed. The fellowship has been wonderful. And just the sense of God and the Spirit of God in the meetings has been very, very real, very blessed. And uh, to enjoy fellowship and friendship with so many of you. Many of you I do go back a long way with. Uh, Brother Trevor as well. Uh, I think we go back even much longer than with James and uh, of course with brother Paul Johnson here and Philip and many many others it's been a great privilege thank you for giving me that opportunity giving me that privilege and uh, you know when you get to my stage in life gospel missions have always been very special to me and I've always enjoyed evangelism I've been involved in the pastoral work and some Bible teaching and so forth but Gospel missions have always been special. I suppose it's where I started out in faith mission work. And uh, I've always enjoyed missions. And uh, when you get to my stage in life, you don't know if this will be the last one or not. And I don't know, but only God knows that. But whatever, we have great memories of the mission, and we thank God for it. I will be here on Sunday night, not uh, in the pulpit, uh, but to join you again for the final night of the mission. Now, we're turning tonight to the Old Testament, turning to the book of Proverbs. Book of Proverbs. And we're reading from chapter 1. Book of Proverbs, chapter 1. I'll give you a moment to turn to it. You see, I had a wee marker in my Bible because I knew where I was going to read. <laughs> but you didn't know. Uh, Proverbs chapter 1, and we read from verse 1. It's a lengthy chapter, so I may just dip into it uh, here and there as we read. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom and justice and judgment and equity, to give subtlety to the simple and to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise, and their dark sayings. We'll skip over to verse 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, and let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave, and whole as those that go down to the pit. And then to... Oh, to verse 15, he says, My son, walk not thou in the way with them, and refrain thy foot from their path. And then verse 20, 
Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the street. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. And in the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my Spirit unto you, and I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called, and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity, and I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your, des and your destruction cometh out of whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But... Whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. Amen. And trusting God again to add his blessing to the public reading of his precious and infallible word uh, to our heart tonight. Book of Proverbs is a very interesting and a very instructive book. Uh, it's maybe different from all the other books that we have in the Bible but it's uh, one that's of tremendous practical and moral and spiritual value. And uh, I'm sure that many of you are already familiar with the book. It contains something, almost 600 proverbs, little pithy sayings that bring a moral application or a practical application or a spiritual challenge, whatever it might be. And of course, many of them have found their way into present-day uh, language and parlance, uh, if not word for word, at least almost word for word. And uh, many of them you hear quoted outside of spiritual and religious places altogether. It deals with all sorts of subjects, and it's so relevant to the day we're living in. It speaks about family relationships, how parents should uh, bring up their children, how children should respect and re uh, agree or respect their parents and those who are in authority over them. Speaks about marriage. It is a very high view of marriage and it certainly uh, takes the view that one man and one woman is a husband and wife and that's the way it should be. Even though it was Solomon who wrote this and uh, yet uh, in wisdom uh, he said that that's how it ought to be. And, of course, he speaks very severely against any sin that would disrupt marriage or destroy marriages. You'll find all that in the book of Proverbs. And so I say it's very relevant to the day we live in. It speaks about friendship and about neighbors. Said that a near neighbor is better than a far-off friend. And uh, how true uh, that can be as well. It speaks about wealth and poverty. It speaks about advice to young people. And it uh, speaks about our speech and our language and our words. And, of course, it speaks about making right choices. Now, because it was Solomon who wrote it, uh, the king of Israel, as we're told in the first verse, uh, the man who was God gave great wisdom to, wisdom greater than anyone else that was about at that time and maybe ever since. Uh, you would expect to find it says much about wisdom in the book, and it certainly does uh, in the book. And there is much wisdom uh, within the book. I'm told there are six different words used for wisdom in the book. 
they all probably have a little different connotation, a little bit different meaning, and so forth. But the one that's in the opening are the second verse of the book, because in those opening verses, it tells you the purpose of the book, what he's hoping to achieve. He said he's writing it that we might know wisdom and instruction, perceive words of understanding, receive the instruction of wisdom and justice and judgment and equity, etc. And so he went on to give us uh, his purpose in writing uh, the book, and he said it is to know wisdom. I understand, uh, or I have read, that, that word, the word wisdom that is used there, uh, that it means uh, something, uh, the, it has the meaning of wisdom to make right choices at an appropriate time. Now, it's not a, a loaded statement. Wisdom to make right choices at an appropriate time. Well, the only time we have is now, because yesterday is in the past, and we can't make any choices. We maybe should have made decisions yesterday or the day before or the week before or a month ago, but we can't do that. And we're not guaranteed the future. None of us are guaranteed another hour of the future. So the appropriate time is now. And it's about making wise choices. I trust that on this final weeknight of the mission, that there will be those in this meeting who will make a wise choice and not go home unsaved, as our brother James has already been speaking about. Wisdom sometimes is personified in the book. It's spoken of as a person speaking. Wisdom calleth in the streets, we read together. And some have said that you can substitute the word wisdom with the word Christ in the book, because Christ is made unto us wisdom, we read in Paul's epistle to the church at Corinth. And so tonight I want us to think a little bit about some of the truths we find in this opening chapter of the book. Uh, there are three voices that are calling to us in this chapter. Now, I'm not going to speak specifically on the three voices that are calling, but there is the call of the world. He said in verse 10, that's why I read it, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay for wait for blood, and let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause, planning robbery, planning violence, and so forth. He said, if you join with us, you'll have a great time. We'll fill our purses. We'll get rich. We'll enjoy it all. It'll be wonderful. Isn't that just like the call of the world today and at all times? Come with us. It'll be attractive, and the world can be very attractive sometimes, well, most times, because it appeals to the, the sin nature that's within us. But you know, the world is not only attractive, and the call of the world is not only attractive, but it's destructive, because the writer here said, surely in vain is the net spread in the sight of any bird. They, lit, they lay wait for their own blood and they lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of every one that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. You know, sin may be appealing and attractive, but it always ends with death, spiritual death, eternal death. And even apart from the eternal death that it brings, sin brings many miseries, many heartaches, to men and women and to young people. Not only does it speak about the call of the world, it speaks about the call of wisdom. And that's what we want to talk about a little bit tonight. Uh, from verse 20 onwards, wisdom crieth without. Wisdom is personified as a, a woman crying in the streets. And we're going to look a little bit at that tonight. And then there's a call, a call of warning. From verse 25 onward, uh, it says, to those who had rejected the call of wisdom, say, but you have said it not. All my counsel would none of my reproof, and I will laugh when you, at, you, at your calamity. 
and mock when your fear cometh, and so it goes on throughout uh, that. But tonight I want us to think something of this call of wisdom uh, that comes to us. And there's, it's a call that reproves us. And I want us to take it as the, the voice of God speaking to our heart, the reproving voice of God. You know, whenever we come to God so often, we look for messages of comfort, messages that will encourage us, messages that will bless us. And we love the verses of Scripture and the Scriptures that tell us that. And Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. We, we just love to get a verse like that, don't we? And there are, there are so many other verses uh, that like that. That, that come to us and that we enjoy reading. Verses that encourage us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What a blessed verse that is. What wonderful message it is to our heart. And so we could multiply those verses forward. But God sometimes has to reprove us. He has to rebuke us. You see, we read in Second. Timothy in chapter 3 and verse 16, where God says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction unto righteousness. Three things that God's Word does to us when God speaks. And the first one is, He reproves us. He tells us we have gone wrong. He tells us we have sinned. Thank God he doesn't stop there. He corrects us. He tells us how to get right. It's given for reproof, for correction. And the only place we can get right is at the cross. And where Jesus died in our place to deal with our sin. And instruction unto righteousness not only how to get right, but how to keep right and to go on right with God and to know the righteousness that he wants to give to us. And so tonight, I want us to think simply, first of all, of the reproof that man despises. You know, in this book of Proverbs, it tells us in chapter 15, it says, he that regardeth reproof is prudent. He that regardeth reproof is prudent. I wonder how have you reacted when sometimes God's message to you has been one of reproof. Do you pay attention to it? Do you try to brush it to the side? Do you just disregard it? Or even as is spoken here in this chapter, do you despise it and say, I don't want to hear that? I don't want to listen to that. I don't think I'm as bad as it at all says. He that regardeth reproof is prudent. You see, when God speaks to us in his reproving voice, he convicts or convinces the intellect of the truth. Scripture is given for reproof, correction, and instruction unto righteousness. And if sometimes you go through the book of Proverbs and keep your eye out for this, it often speaks about reproof and reproving. But very often it's connected with the word instruction. Instruction. And that's what we read together, of course, here in this chapter. In verse chapter 5 and verses 12 to 13. Have we read? And just let me turn them up to make sure that I get them right. It says, this is someone regretting a life of sin and regretting a life away from God, the sin they'd fallen into. And, and he says, how have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined my ear to them that instructed me. So God's method of improve, or God's ministry of reproving was instructing the mind, 
teaching them what is right and what is wrong, convincing the mind. And I trust that as you have listened to the gospel in this mission, and in many a previous mission, that you've come to the place where you have to acknowledge in your mind you believe what we say. In your mind, you're convinced of what we say. You do not argue against the Word of God or even the preaching of the gospel when we speak about how far we've got away from God, about the guilt that, that, that's in every soul and maybe the guilt in your own heart. You say, I know. In your mind, you know. You understand that you're a sinner. You understand that you're separated from God. You understand all about that. And in your mind, you understand now that Jesus Christ came from heaven, died upon a cross in order that your sin might be forgiven, to make you to be a new person, to come into your life, and to live his life through you, to change you. You see, I know all of that. I've heard that in Sunday school. I've heard that in church. I've heard that in many another mission. You see, in your mind, you, 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 you're already educated, if you like, in these things. But mentally, your intellect is convinced of these messages. But not only when God speaks with his reproving voice does it convince the mind or the intellect, but it stirs the emotions. It makes us feel, not just think and know, but to feel. The reaction to what we know is often seen and felt within our emotions and within our heart as we speak about. You see, the reproving voice of God stirs our emotions to feel our guilt, to feel our regrets over sin, to feel our shame about sin. It makes us feel that, to feel a fear of being lost, Maybe a fear of the Lord Jesus coming back and being left behind as we spoke Sunday night and you know that you're not ready. In your mind, you're already convinced of that. But now in your heart, your emotions have been stirred and you feel that, convinced of that. You remember in the Acts of the Apostles, the day of Pentecost, whenever the Peter preached, and Peter preached about Christ that they had rejected, and he said, you delivered him to be crucified, but God has raised him from the dead, and he preached the gospel. What do we read? We read that their hearts, were, they were cut to the heart. And they said, men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? They were cut to the heart. That phrase means they were just torn apart. They were emotionally upset and stirred. When they realized what they had done to Jesus Christ, when they realized the guilt of rejecting Jesus Christ, it broke them down. Oh, that that same feeling might come to hearts. We could think of many others. We think of Felix. The Apostle Paul spoke to Felix. Felix was a judge, of course, and Paul was a prisoner. But whenever he spoke to him, and we read that Felix had more knowledge of that excellent way. He had excellent knowledge of the way. So he knew. In his mind, he was already convinced. But when Paul spoke to him about righteousness, oh, Felix felt his sinfulness because he was living in a an adulterous relationship. When he spoke to him about judgment, we read that Felix trembled. He trembled. You see, his emotions were stirred. We could name others in Scripture, and some of us have known, 
Some of us have experienced this for ourselves. I remember the mission where God wonderfully saved me. I'd been to many gospel missions. My parents were believers, and they took us to all the meetings and all the missions. But you know, in that mission, God spoke to me. And while I had known in my mind all along that I needed to be saved, I well remember that mission in the town hall in Cookstown. An English evangelist, Marshall Shallis. I understand he did a mission in Oma sometime many, many years ago now too. But I can remember feeling I was trembling sitting in the meeting. Just a little boy of 12 years of age. But oh, I felt so convicted. I felt so lost. And thank God that night that I walked out to the front of that meeting to seek God to be my Savior. Not only does it convince the mind when God begins to speak, stirs the emotions, but it challenges the will. He said, turn ye at my reproof. He's calling for them to act, and we always act with their will. He said, I called, and you refused. That was an act of the will. He said, no man regard it. That was an act of the will to, to ignore and what, what God was saying to them. He said to them, you did not choose the fear of the Lord, verse 29. You see, they had a choice to make. and They had a decision to make. And when God began to speak to them, convincing their mind that they knew what he was saying was right and true, accepting it, feeling stirred in their heart, then they had to make a decision. Just like every one of us when we come on to the sound of the gospel, just like you, when God begins to speak and deal with you, I trust and we've been praying much in this mission, and you know that. The precious souls will come and seek God tonight. They'll make that decision. I understand. I wasn't able to tune in last night to listen on Zoom, but I understand. But Kitty sang, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. That's what you've got to say tonight. In this meeting, to resist the reproof that man despises. Let me say very quickly, because time has gone tonight, the clock always seems to go faster than me. The resistance that man displays. God reproves, but he said man displays a resistance. He said, you've despised all my reproof. You would have none of my counsel. They rejected his voice. They rejected his word. If we were to turn over to chapter 29 of this book, we read there in the first verse, he that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. That tells me three things about the resistance of human beings and human minds and human hearts to the Word of God. There's been a persistent refusal. He that being often reproved. How often has God spoken to you? How often has God reproved you? How often have you felt the tug of the Spirit of God in your heart to come to the cross and to come to Christ and to get saved? He spoke to you when you were a child, perhaps. Sunday school. Maybe at your home as your mother or your father taught you the Bible and the Word of God. and Maybe godly parents that taught you the, the way of salvation. Maybe a long time ago now. 
if you can still remember that, or maybe as a teenager, a young person, again, with all the energy of a teenager and the clarity of mind, and you were in a gospel meeting or some friend got saved and began to witness to you, maybe at various stages throughout your life, Maybe the time of your marriage, maybe the birth of a child. Maybe in some time of trial and difficulty. Maybe tragedy came to your family or to your home. And you felt God speaking. You felt God speaking. I knew a man many years ago now, and he's now in the glory, lived outside Lurgan. He had a little time for God. I'm not sure that he, he ever went much to church. He had a family. His wife was a believer. I know he had, he had a little girl of 14. She had read the lesson at the Harvest Thanksgiving service in the school in Lurgan. We were doing missions in that area at that time. We didn't know the family then. She came out of the assembly hall where they'd had the harvest service in the school. She walked down the corridor of the school and she dropped dead. Thank God she was saved and she went to be with Christ. But for nine months, I think it was or more, that father never got over it. Well, he wouldn't get over it at any time. But that father began to think about eternal things and spiritual things and about his daughter who had gone to heaven. And he wasn't ready. And I think it was about nine, twelve months later, he bowed the knee and he sought God to save him. See, God spoke to him through circumstances in life. How often has he been speaking to you through this mission, in previous missions, at various times in your life, in various circumstances? Maybe just through the very goodness of God. See, we read in the book of Romans, Knowest thou not that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Some people ask sometimes, why does God bless people that have no time for him? Why has God prospered people that are not Christians? Maybe they take his name in vain, the curse and the swear, and yet somehow it seems God's been good to them in many ways. He's been good to you and given you a good family, comfortable home and all of that. Everything we have is God who allows it and gives it to us. Why does God do that? Knowest thou not that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? It is that we might acknowledge his goodness, repent of our sin, and trust the Savior. But not only is there a persistent refusal, there is progressive hardening. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck. Oh, it's a reality in many lives. Writer in the book of Hebrews said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. See, we read in the Old Testament about Pharaoh, don't we? And we read that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Did you get that? God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, why would God harden Pharaoh's heart? Because God, first of all, Pharaoh hardened his own heart against God. Whenever Moses went to Pharaoh, asked for the children of Israel to go out of the land just to worship God, he said, who is the Lord that I should know him? I know not the Lord. He defied God. He hardened his heart. And then every time after that, God hardened his heart. 
God hardened his heart. Do you remember Herod in the New Testament? John the Baptist witnessed to Herod. And then whenever John the Baptist, Herod, of course, was living in sinful relationship, he had John the Baptist beheaded. But then whenever Jesus Christ was put on trial, they sent for Herod and sent him to Herod. And Herod was glad because he had many things he wanted to ask him. But Jesus answered him not a word, not a word. What happened? God's voice to Herod was through John. And John cut off the voice of God. And then God had nothing more to say to him. His heart had been hardened. And then it speaks about a perished hope shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. We read in these verses where we were speaking together, reading together tonight, in chapter 1 in the book of Proverbs here, where he said, Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but have set it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. There's your persistent refusals. God says, I will laugh at your calamity, mock when your fear cometh. He said, then shall they call upon me, and I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they'll not find me. What's God saying? He says, when I was calling and inviting them to come, they wouldn't come. The heart was hardened. Now, whenever they, and some, whenever they're at the end of life, and they call on God because they know there's no other way, God says, I will not answer. I will not answer. See that little verse in Genesis 6, 3 that you may be familiar with? God said, my spirit will not always strive with man. Or as the poem says, there is a time we know not when, a place we know not where, that seals the destiny of man for glory or despair. Across that line it is to die, to die as if by stealth. It doesn't dull the beaming eye or pale the glow of health. But on the forehead God has set indelibly a mark. Unseen by man, for man as yet is blind and in the dark. Opportunities can go past and never return. A response that God desires, it's repentance. Turn you at my reproof, he said. I will put my spirit within you. He desires regeneration to make you new. Thank God tonight he's still talking. If you still feel a stirring in your heart, if you still feel that emotion in your soul because of God's spirit speaking to you, you haven't crossed that deadline. You can come tonight. God says, turn you at my reproof. Turn from your sin. Turn from the world. Come back, come to Christ. And he says, I'll put my spirit within you. Thank God he'll save you tonight. He'll give you the very life of God in your soul tonight. <coughs> if you'd only come. And then he said in that final verse, he says, But those who hearken unto me, those who listen to me, they shall dwell safely, and they shall be quiet from the fear of evil. Oh, they'll have peace. They'll have assurance. They'll not fear that day when we meet Christ. 
Wesley said in his hymn, No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him are mine, alive in him, my living head, clothed in his righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne, claim the crown through Christ my own. There's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. If you come tonight, you need never fear condemnation because there is none. Will you come tonight? Seek the Lord. God has been speaking to you. God has been reproving. And maybe you've been despising that reproof or you've been putting it off. You're maybe already aware of that progressive hardening. Whenever somehow you feel that you're not as responsive to preaching and to the gospel and to the voice of God as you were years ago, it had a deeper effect on you then. That's because you're hardening. You come before it's too late. You come tonight. May God bless you tonight. May God give you grace to come and grace to respond to his word. Thank you for listening to this mission message. It may be that this message has deeply challenged your heart concerning your need of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If that is so, please contact us for help and prayer and literature using the information that will now appear on the screen. It'll be our privilege to help you in any way that we possibly can. God bless you, your friend in Christ's service, Pastor Paul Johnston of Fintana Independent Methodist Church.